So welcome to the Western Hemisphere Virtual Symplectic Seminar. I think this is our last talk of the semester. We'll be resuming in the new year. Um, for our speaker, we're happy to have Deptan Asen from USC, who will tell us about the ZMOD P Giesen sequence in symplectic cohomology. Thank you. All right. So, uh, yeah. So the title of my talk is, as you can see, the ZMOD P Giesen sequence in symplectic cohomology. Um, so I'll begin with a few preliminaries that should be, that must be known to everyone here, but just for the sake of completeness. So um, symplectic cohomology is used as an invariant of a class of exact symplectic manifolds that's, that's called Liouville domains. So the basic picture to keep in mind is some sort of a compact manifold with let's say a puncture and some boundary condition. Um, and as usual, um, symplectic cohomology, which we'll de de denote by SH star of M, is uh, is roughly the Morse cohomology of the action functional H on the free loop space of the manifold, uh, induced by some almost complex structure on the manifold. And then in case of Liouville domain, this thing only makes sense for special kind of Hamiltonians, things that are linear near the boundary. Um, and, and we define them to be the increasing limit of such, of the floor complexes of such linear Hamiltonians as is common. And now the thing is that there's this natural S1 action on the free loop space that acts by rotation, right? So this is just to take a loop and then rotate it by whatever angle the S1 gives you. And this gives us a, as this gives us some re re refinements on the existing structure of symplectic cohomology. And th those are the objects of our, objects of interest to us. All right. So now uh, S1 equivalent floor cohomology can be defined in several ways. Well, one of them, the way Bourgeois and Onshaw did, did defined in the defined it in the paper is to directly follow the so they recall that um, ordinary equivalent cohomology. So for spaces with <clears throat> an S1 action. We define the ordinary equivalent cohomology as like the ordinary cohomology of X fiber product with S1, with ES1. And they sort of carry on the same idea in, in the symplectic sense. So they take a take a special kind of Hamiltonian on this space and then where ES1 is modeled co co concretely as the increasing limit of odd essence. And on that, they directly construct the Morse homology that they mirror the construction of symplectic cohomology as Morse cohomology. And then on this sort of LM fiber product ES1. There's one more way to construct such equivalent theories and that's uh, that goes to defining a that's a more formal way so that goes to geometrically defining an action of c star s1 on the flow symplectic cochain complex so what we do is we have so we have a small model for of chains of S1, which is given by some field K adjoint lambda mod lambda squared, right? Where this is, so this is a small model for chains of S1. And what we do is we construct a, we construct and so we show that our symplectic cochain complex has the structure of an infinity C star K lambda lambda squared mod module. So 
show that SH has the structure of K lambda lambda squared module, uh, A infinity module. <clears throat> right, and using those, that gives us a series of sequence of operators, the A infinity and the infinity action gives us a sequence of operators and using those operators we define our using those operators we define um s1 equivalent symplectic homology so this gives us a sequence of operators and using those we formally define symplectic homology So our notation should would be SH sub S1. Okay. And of course, there are other data which are subsumed here, like the say, almost complex structure and so on, the Hamiltonian, etc. All right. Now, since Z mod P embeds into S1 via roots of unity, it can be reasonably expected that Z mod P equivalent symplectic homology should exist too. And in fact, there are multiple definitions in literature for different flavors of flow theory. Seidel defined it for Z mod two in the case of ordinary flow homology of a compact manifold. Shelukin and Zhao has extended that to Z mod P and then Wilkins also defines Z mod two equivariant symplectic homology in his quantum strain reductions paper. So what we do is the first thing we do is we sort of um, try to construct a infinity action of C's chains of chains on ZP on the symplectic coach, C symplectic complex, symplectic quotient complex, and from there we try to define, sorry, from there we define Z mod P equivalent symplectic cohomology for all primes P. That's that's the first proposition. So this here is a small model for, so we take the second approach as we talked about before. that we have a small model for chains of chains on ZP and we define a C sequence of maps um, that satisfy high infinite equations. So for, by that, I mean something like you can have, let's say, So I, I, I will not write them down. Those, those are long things, but basically what we have is, you know, we have the, we have a sequence of inputs coming from here yeah, joins Z mod P and then you contract the inputs or you group the inputs into different smaller mu case. And if you sum over all such combinations, you get zero. That's the sort of infinity relationships one we we prove that these maps satisfy, and um, and then for in the case of p equals two, one can again take these operators into into defining uh, S H star Z mod two, which is Z mod two equivalent S H. So this is Z mod two equivalent S H, and generally. This would be our notation for Z mod P equivalent SH as well. And we, we do it in the same way, like we take a formal variable and then we define a formal operator del delta equivariant, which satisfies delta square equals zero because of the infinite relationships. And then 
taking the limits of those <clears throat> complexes as slope of the Hamilton increases, we define our Zimmer to equivalent <coughs> simplectic cohomology. So general P, one needs to adjoin two variables and the definition of the differential becomes a little complicated to write down so for, for which we have omitted it. But again, all the information we need is essentially here in the maps that we define. Okay. All right. So then our... Is, is there a way of directly obtaining the action of this group ring from the action of, uh, I, I think you call it lambda, like change zone S1? Sorry, I couldn't hear you. Can you repeat that? Sure. Um, like the S1 action on the chain level was the action of this uh, two dimensional A infinite algebra. Right, is, right, is, right. There, is there a natural map, for instance, from, from this group ring to uh, this other uh, algebra to C star S1? So that whenever you have an action of uh, this guy, C of uh, this K lambda over lambda square, you also automatically obtain an action of the group ring below. No, I mean, that's one of the problems we faced while constructing our gazing sequence. There's no way to, so since, you know, this does not admit this group ring as a subset, there is no way to actually get one action from the other. But what we do is we take a cellular model and construct that action on the cochain complex, which sort of restricts on both sides to these two actions. Okay. 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 Donna, can I ask a question? Sure, sure. Fine. Can you say something about why, when p is greater than two, you have these two variables? So it's like um, th these are all. What are these? So these are all um, like uh, this is a. These are modules over. In the case of z mod p, th this is a module over b z z mod two, right? Mm -hmm. Which is basically z mod two adjoined some one variable, but when we, when we have bzp, that, that that has two adjoining variables, right? Okay. With with zp, so we need to adjoin two variables. So this would be modules over bzp now, and to get the module, and then how how we take the module action into account is basically why we have to adjoin those two variables. Thanks. So this is Zemo to adjoin some variable of uh, degree one, but when it's BZP, we need to adjoin two variables. And that's why the, there are, the differential becomes complicated. Anyway, um, all right, so let's, so then as I was saying, our result would essentially, relate SH Z mod P with SH sub S1 is what the keys in sequence does. But before I state that, let's talk a bit about the usual topological keys in sequence, which is a classical fact. Um, so there's this usual keys in sequence <clears throat> that comes from analyzing the vibration, which is, um, like, so you take a look at the so you look at this one bundle. Mm. X plus S one over sorry, ES one over X fiber product ES1, and then analyzing the series spectral sequence gives us this thing, right? That's a classical fact. And extending this, there's also a in the topological case, since 
Z mod P again embeds into S1. As S1 action necessarily gives us a Z mod P action. So then in, in the and there's this topological is in sequence really relating Z mod P equivariant cohomology with S1 equivariant cohomology, which is um which again comes from the fact that So, so this comes from the fact that X fiber product over ZP ES1 is a, sorry, is a S1 mod Z mod P bundle over X fiber product S1, E S1, right? And also, also of course, this is a, I'll come back to that. Uh, so this is a, we look at this thing, which is a S1 mod Z mod P bundle over X fiber product E S1. And from the fact that ZP acts freely on ES1, we, we can say that ES1 is also a model for EZ mod P. And therefore the cohomology of this is ZP equivalent cohomology of X and the cohomology of the base is S1 equivalent cohomology of S. And again, looking at the set spectral sequence gives us four. And also if, if, if one carries out the computation, like if one actually goes through the computation, it would be apparent that the Euler class, which is basically did this map here in the classical Gaussian sequence is multiplication by the Euler class. So this map here is multiplication by the Euler class. And here too is the same thing, but the Euler class is P times the, because of this Z mod P quotienting, the Euler class is P times the usual one. And therefore this map here is a multiple of P, which is a fact which would be important for, for the statement of our theorem. Right, so th these are the topological Gaussian sequences that one, one has whenever we have a space X with an S1 action. And our Gaussian sequence is a generalization of this to, um, to symplectic cohomology. And it was first conjectured to exist by Seidel. And it must be mentioned here that a Gaussian sequence of this type, which relates ordinary symplectic cohomology to S1 equivariant symplectic cohomology has been proven by Bourdieu Aonsha. So this citation here was actually meant for that. And I haven't removed that, so sorry about that. The classical one is just a fact that can be found in any, I would say, algebraic, um, sorry, any topology textbook. But for for the one that relates S1 equivariant symplectic cohomology to ordinary symplectic cohomology, Bourgeois and Sha in the paper established one in the vein of three and what we have done is we have established a result similar to this in the context of symplectic homology. So it says that we have a sequence like this and with Z mod P coefficients, this one splits giving us a relationship between two um, theories. And I should mention what U here is. 
so basically these are all so shs1 is a module over bs1 which has a model as k joined u and that's the variable u so the map u is just the map the module map between s from shs1 to s1 which says multiplication by u all right um so what we do is so um maybe we should say a few words about this thing like how this is not a uh, standalone fact so basically so there there is a so i have so there's a canonical gaussian sequence in the category of C star S1 modules. These are all A infinity modules. And, and when one views these things, so SH upper star is a C star S1 module. And for any sister S1 module, what we can do is we can take their derived tensor products or their or HOM from the field to them to give us different flavors of the equivariant theories. So module, we have two complexes. One is the derived tensor product. So this is no notation adapted from Shields paper. And this field is a with is a module with the trivial C star S1 action. So we have two complexes. We can do this, or we can take home from K into SH star. This is like the derived tensor products. This is the derived homomorphisms. These are defined as suitable bar complexes. And then we have a canonical Gaussian sequence, which is basically something like K shifted by one degree to K lambda joined lambda squared, which is of the small model, and to K and so on. And basically, the idea is that once you take once you push for push forward these sequences by the tensor product or the derived homomorphisms, we get our usual Gaussian sequences. So pushing forward these by suitable functors. Gives usual Gaussian sequences. <clears throat> so there's also so there's also um, similar exact sequences like star for C star ZP, which is K adjoint ZP modules. And similar pushing forward gives us our 
gives us, sorry, not results like this, but results like this right here. Um, results in the vein of three. So that's what the next slide says, is that there is a purely formal algebraic Gizin sequence, which, which is just given by restricting the chains of S1 actions to the chains of, chains of ZP action. But so the model that we take for chains of S1 do not have chains of ZP as a direct subgroup. That's the problem. So we cannot just take this abstract algebraic fact and apply it to our case. So what we do is we construct a cellular model of S1, which is which basically looks like this. Um, so we have h squared equals zero, tau to the p equals one, and then p h equals tau minus one. So it's just a group ring adjoint two variables where we mod out by these relationships. And we construct, and as you can see, this has both C star S1 and C star ZP, the small models, as its direct subgroups. And we construct an action of that on our symplectic quotient complex. So action of this on SH, and we show that basically when we restrict to the subgroups, the, these recover the existing constructions of S1 equivariant symplectic homology. And then we can use the algebraic fact and the fact that we can, that we have exact triangles like this to construct our Gizin sequence. All right. Um, yeah. So that's uh, basically the result. So does this cellular model come from, I don't know, refining the, uh, what's it called, like the triangulation, or like but basically by dividing S1 into uh, something like key pieces? Yeah, yeah, that's the thing, yes. It's like we have, this is this small angle is H, and then tau is this point over here. This is one, let's say. Is that what you were saying? Uh, yeah, that's what I was asking, thanks. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly how the cellular model is. Uh, that, that's basically the idea behind the cellular model. This small piece over here, this small, how, how should I say it? Uh, arc, let's say is, is H and then there are, there's, then they start Z mod P are they embedded as roots of unity and the relationships just come from looking at the type. Thank you. Um, all right, so that's um, how the Giesen sequence is, is, is um, proved. And then um, what we do next is illustrate an a example in the case of um, localized symplectic homology. So before that, we start with a classical result. This, this again was proved by Ati and Bot, and it says that it relates the S1 equivalent homology to the fixed point set, like the map. So we have a Space, space X equipped with a S1 action. And let's say F is the fixed point set. And in nice cases, we have um, we have that this map is an isomorphism after inverting the U action. The U action is again, so U is again, like comes from BS1. these quantities. Um, so what the, this says is that we have a have an isomorphism like this. So the S1 equivalent homology of X can be recovered from 
the usual cohomology of the fixed point set tensored with some polynomial ring. And th this has been known to fail for infinity dimensional manifolds and in particular for symplectic cohomology as well. And to re remedy that, we have Zhao and ACF defined defined a the de defined version of symplectic cohomology and S1 equivalent symplectic cohomology, sorry, and prove that we have a localized on this result that looks like this. Right. So again, uh, the <clears throat> manifold itself is the fixed point of the S1 action, right? Because th this is the space of constant loops, and the constant loops are the fixed points of the S1 action. And what this says is that this inclusion becomes a becomes an isomorphism of um, the rationals that join U modules after we take tensor both sides with Q. Right. So this is the same result in the vein of Athiabot localization and our aim is to study that, study a mysterious aspect of Zhao's computation. So what she computed in her paper was a result like this. Sorry, it was a result that looks like this. And what this tells us that even with integral coefficient coefficients, our um, localized S1, equivalent simplectic cohomology recovers rational cohomology. And that motivated Seidel to, motivated to Seidel to conjecture that if SH star of M is equal to zero, then we should be, we, we must have um, isomorphism like this, which is basically an extension of the computation that Zhao did. Right, and so our, our Giesen sequence, along with um, some work that is in preparation by Shelukin and Jang, has uh, will allow us to answer that this conjecture is true. All right. So how do we do that? But first, before we go go into the uh, rough proof of this conjecture, we, we we should note here that <clears throat> that the condition SHM equals zero is actually required. And Zhao shows that in the case of C star, the result doesn't hold. All right. Um, so we prove the essentially um, equivalent proposition that we prove that if SHM is zero, then with Z mod B coefficients, S1 equivalent symplectic cohomology localized version vanishes for all P. And roughly the idea, which was again suggested by Seidel, that while this is to use the splitting in the Giesen sequence, so we said that with Z mod P coefficients, our Giesen sequence splits to give us some sort of a result like SH star Z mod P of M is two copies of SH S1. And we use this splitting splitting to give us a result that SH star of ZP is nearly equivalent to SH S1, and then establish some sort of a localization result which relates SH star of ZP to ordinary symplectic cohomology. And th th this is the part where which Shelukin and Jang has done. And well, it's, it's, um, so there, there's a lot of work has been done in this way, in, in this the direction, and it's not, not only due to Shalukin and Jang. So for in, in the case of um, uh, 
like so for a compact M, Seidel has proved an existence of. So what the localization result says is that basically we have a degree P map like this, and then once we localize this with respect to the Z mod P structure, this gives us an isomorphism. And Seidel has showed this in case of P equals two, Shelukin and Zhao has proved it for any prime P, and this is like, this is in the compact case. And for the non-compact case, uh, Wilkins has proved it for P equal to two before, and then Shelukin and Zhang in, in, in a work that is in preparation have, has proved it that, has proved that this one extends to, there's a first there's a degree P map and that extends to an isomorphism on localized Z mod P equivalent cohomology. And once we have that, we can conclude our proposition, which is, which then allows us to answer the conjecture in the, as true. Okay, so that's one, um, that's one a, a, a application of our result. And now in the time that I have left, I will try to construct the, I'll try to give you a few proofs of the, of the Giesin sequence. So one thing that's very interesting is the construction of the Z mod P action. Um, so, so construction, so basically the construction of the K lambda lambda squared action i.e. the cells of S1 action. One, there are very good references for that. So, Zhao's periodic um, symplectic homologies, that paper has a reference that, that constructs all the operators very nicely. And we will sort of follow the same idea into constructing. So, we'll construct a Z mod P action, sorry, chains of Z mod P action on the symplectic quotient complex. <clears throat> and how, how we do that is, so there's a very nice pictorial approach. So we look at, so basically our idea is to construct maps of this type, let's say blank that go from SH star to SH star and have a certain degree, right? And th these are basically omega one up to omega k are objects in Z mod P. So we look at cylinders where the top is asymptotic to one orbit x plus, the bottom is asymptotic to one other another orbit x minus, and then in, in, in the and then we have that it's decorated by these. So let's say the first decorated by these points. Omega one, shit. Hang on. I guess. Yeah, my pencil ran out of charge. Give me a few seconds. I, I, I'll. This should not take long. So, so what we do is we have these this cylinder which is decorated by points, and to each point we assign one of the angles 
omega 1, omega 2, omega k, and then we take and take a Hamiltonian that starts at actually I said something wrong. So we don't do this directly on the symplectic complex, we do it for one of the Hamiltonians h tau to the same complex. And the idea is that at, let's say this is length zero, this is like r cross s1, so at z zero cross s1, let's say we have omega one, then at some height L1, we have omega two, then a little bit of portion where we keep, which we keep empty for a reason. And then we have at height L2, we have omega three and so on. And what we do is we look at Hamiltonians that behave like h tau on the top end and the Hamiltonian data is like this, which is h tau on the, on the top end and at the bottom and then between, sorry, let's invert this, which is h tau here and then between And then there's a small part where the Hamiltonian interpolates between omega one upper star h tau and between this small length, we have omega one, omega two whole square, sorry, omega two upper, upper star h tau and so on. We have a Hamiltonian that behaves like this. And then depending upon how, depending upon, whether these lengths, so depending upon as Li goes to zero or Li goes to infinity, we get in the um, compactification of these modular spaces. broken cylinders. And again, counting the rigid elements gives us basically the infinity relationship that we want this to satisfy, right? So if let's say one of the lengths go to infinity, then what we have is something like this, then we have a term of the type um, let's go right here. Turn off the type this, and if one of the lengths go to zero, then that that gives us term where one of the omegas are multiplied. And along with that, the was cylinder can break off from the top or from the bottom, which gives us the differential terms plus something else. And everything must count to zero. So that's basically how we construct the Z mod P action, right? So, um, Daniel, can I ask a question? Sure. So if 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 several consecutive LIs go to zero, so several consecutive points collide, you end up bubbling off a sphere. Is that right? That's right. But that's not uh, if several LIs go to zero. That's not in uh, I think co, 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 co dimension one, right? So th these are we are looking at co, co dimension one boundary. Yeah. I mean, I would have expected it is in co dimension one, but I might not be understanding something. Um, 
I guess it's, I'm not sure. Um, if I, if several of the allies go to, not sure. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> anyway, as I was saying, uh, so th that gives us the Z mod P chains of the Z mod P action, and then the cell P action, which, as I said before, we look at something like this. is constructed by basically um, so we basically can follow the same recipe for z mod p and for k lambda mod lambda squared and we look at cylinders where both the actions are happening simultaneously so it's a little hard to write down by following the same ideas. But but if since we are basically looking at the, um, since the moduli spaces are basically the same, once we restrict them to their two subgroups, chains on S1 and chains on ZP, we, have, we get that the restriction of the action gives us our usual S1 equivalent symplectic homology and Z mod P equivalent symplectic homology. I guess um, I'll be stopping here. There's anyway two minutes left and there's nothing more I would say if that would take two more minutes. Okay. Okay, let's thank our speaker. Questions? So I have a similar question to what I was asking uh, a minute ago, just in the case that one of the allies go to zero. Uh, so just to make sure I'm understanding, in that case, what do you bubble off? So if one of the allies go to zero, it's like, a, it's the same cylinder, right? It's just that the markers have multiplied themselves. So we get a term like this. So it's like a cylinder in one. Right dimension lower where two of the markers have multiplied themselves so it's so it's one of those so if you write down the infinite equations for a, for the for the kkzp actions you will we'll see that we get a t -t 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 term like this and that accounts for that yeah okay okay i think i'm understanding so you bubble off a sphere with three punctures that you interpret as a pair of pants so it's the product right yeah I, maybe that's, that's true Other questions? Okay, if not, let's thank Dettan again. Thanks. Thank you.